God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Today on this first Sunday in Lent, we look at Matthew's Gospel for a word of inspiration and guidance. The story of the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness has been the subject of much debate and discussion since its emergence as part of the Jesus narrative. Here we have a story about the ancient struggle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And so the story goes. Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. There he faced three temptations. We have this story in part as a reminder. It is intended to help us remember that in places of great temptation, we can experience the power of God and the blessing of God's abundant grace. This story reminds us that in places of great temptation, we can discover our capacity to emerge victorious, though the odds might not appear promising and a betting man might well bet against us. Here is what James says. Count it all joy when you are faced with trials and temptations. For the trying and the testing of your faith works patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Blessed is the one who endures temptations, for when they are tried, they shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Now, the word temptation has unfortunately become associated with unenlightened religion. It has become associated with a time that has long since passed us by. It sounds old and outdated. It is no longer part of our daily vocabulary. As a young boy, I would hear the old folk talk about temptation all the time. But while we almost never hear conversations about people being tempted or succumbing to temptations, at least not in a serious way, the casualties in our various battles with our ancient foe continue to mount. I recall an old saying that goes, not talking about it doesn't make it go away. Each day, we are tempted to live and act in ways that do not serve us well. And each day, many succumb to these temptations. We hear the stories of high profile accounts through television, newspaper, radio, and internet reports. We read lengthy commentaries in the blogosphere and witness the acerbic humor of comedians who poke fun at the misbehavior of famous people. But there are also stories that never reach the front page of the daily news. There are many stories that never become the lead stories of news broadcasts, but the consequences are no less real. The consequences of living and acting in ways that do not serve us well 
adversely affect the lives of individuals, of families, of communities, institutions, our nation, and our world. Our decision not to use the word temptation in our private conversations or public debates does not negate its reality. I believe we must reclaim this word, for in it is an important key to understanding what happens when we are faced with tempting possibilities that could well be our undoing. Matthew says, the devil approached Jesus on three separate occasions, tempting him. The Apostle Paul and the Gospel writers refer to this devil, this evil personality, as the adversary. The adversary tempted Jesus. When we succumb to the adversary, this evil personality in the world, some things, perhaps many things, which had the potential to grow and blossom just wither and die on the vine. Many have failed to reach their full potential. And you may know of some of these people. Many have failed to make the contribution to human history they could have made because they were overcome by the adversary. These wilderness temptations occurred repeatedly in our Lord's ministry. The first temptation was the temptation to work miracles for the sake of immediate gratification. The second temptation was to give a sign of his divinity, a convincing sign of his divinity. And the third temptation was to become someone he was not. Let's look at the first temptation. This was the temptation to work miracles for the sake of immediate gratification. Command that these stones be made bread. Here, Jesus is tempted to use the power of God within him without concern for the big picture, the global view, and the larger issues of life. Here he is tempted to focus only on himself. As our Lord was tempted to use the power of God without concern for the larger issues of life, so too are we. As our Lord was tempted to focus only on himself, we too are tempted to do the same. We live by bread, this is true, but we do not live by bread alone. We need more. The spiritual life is an exploration of the things we need beyond mere bread. These are the things that must at times become more important to us than bread. We live by bread, but not by bread alone. We need more. We need a deeper understanding of God. We need a better understanding of one another. We need a clearer understanding of ourselves. We need more. We need a more compassionate world. We need more loving families. And we need more forgiving people. We need more. We live by bread 
but not by bread alone. The story is told of a starving Bedouin traveler who, upon finding this great treasure in the desert sand, and he cried out and said, it's only diamonds. It is only diamonds. In those places where we hunger, where our human hunger is most severe, like the Bedouin traveler, we look at bread and say, it is only bread. The fool says, I need nothing but the pleasures of this world. And the wise say, I need more. The second temptation our Lord faced was to give a convincing sign of his divinity, a convincing sign of his divine power. Matthew says, then the adversary took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. The pinnacle was a tower on which one could be seen by the crowds in Jerusalem. Here on this exalted platform, Jesus was tempted to do something sensational to prove his divinity. Because we are human, because we are merely mortal, dust we are to dust we shall return, we are often more attracted by that which is sensational than by the simple miracles of life. The media outlets exploit our appetite for that which is sensational. The well-known rule of American journalism is this, if it does not bleed, it does not lead. If it is not sensational, it will not make the front page. Because we are merely mortal, because our feet are made of clay, we often want God to prove his power in our lives and in the lives of others by doing something sensational. We say quietly and sometimes not so quietly, God, do something miraculous, do something sensational, then, then, then I will believe. But God would rather see our simple trust in his love, rather than turning water into wine, God would rather wait for us to simply believe in his love and to walk in that belief. Our daily walk with God and our simple trust in God's love for us deepen our understanding of the mysteries of the kingdom. Our daily walk with God makes us more noble people and draws us to the very heart of our Creator. And there, at that place, we see light that we have never seen before. We become new people. The third temptation was to become someone he was not. 
This was essentially a temptation for Jesus to forget his true identity, to forget who he was, to forget who he had come into the world to be. This was essentially a temptation to become someone else. Now it is very easy to lose ourselves in the mad rush for popularity. Becoming well liked, popular or famous can quickly become our primary ambition. Jesus came into the world to exercise spiritual power and spiritual leadership. This was his true identity. Spiritual leadership in general is not as easy to understand as political leadership. Spiritual leadership is not as easily defined as political leadership. They wanted, the, the demonic powers wanted Jesus to provide this spiritual, this political, rather, leadership. Spiritual leadership and political leadership are both necessary and sometimes one grows out of the other. But the point of the story is to teach us to remain true to our calling, true to our identity, true to our purpose, whatever that might be. In William Shakespeare's Hamlet, we hear the words, to thine own self be true. It is always tempting to seek those paths that make people stand up and take notice of who we are. For we all want and need a certain kind of recognition and approval and a certain sense of success. But if we choose the path, which is not the path God has chosen for us, we may forfeit that full sense of recognition and approval for which we deeply hunger. If we could summarize the lesson Jesus teaches in this story, it would be this. Stay true to your gifts, remain faithful, stay true to your spiritual identity and your sense of calling and each time you make the right decision for your life, the angels will come and they will minister to you. And there, in that place, with the angels, you will find strength for the next portion of the journey. Let us pray. Grant us, O God, the power to endure and to overcome the temptations that come our way. Keep us ever mindful of our need to seek those paths that help us to make the right decisions for our lives. And keep us ever mindful that your grace is sufficient. And through our living, you will demonstrate time and time again your love for us.